everybody, I'm Al Rochelle, and welcome to this segment where we're going to talk about POTS rehabilitation in teens and young adults. And I'm pleased to be joined now by Dr. Philip Fisher and Shelly Ahrens. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. A lot to talk about during this segment. Let's start with about a little of your backgrounds, if you would, and how you're involved with POTS. Yeah, I've been a general pediatrician for about 30 years now, so I get to take care of children with their families for whatever is going on. But for the last 20 years at the Mayo Clinic, that's focused on children and adolescents with chronic fatigue and chronic pain. And we've realized a lot of them have POTS and a lot of them need a lot of help recovering. Wow, and your background? So I'm a nurse practitioner working at the Mayo Clinic with POTS patients, where I've worked for about the last nine years. And I also work in the Pediatric Pain Rehabilitation Center program at Mayo Clinic. Rehab. It is possible to be rehabilitated from something like this, although you may not be, in quotes, cured. Let's talk about that whole notion. From day one when we knew that POTS existed or when it was named, has rehabilitation always been a part of the protocol or did, or did we know if it would even work? We're continuing to learn more all the time. Some get discouraged because they feel so bad. Most get discouraged because it's terrible to have POTS. But we're learning more and more that rehabilitation and full recovery are possible for the majority of patients. Okay, when we say it's possible, uh, doctor, what, what do we mean? What's what percent? 80 percent? 90 percent? Does it depend upon somebody's will? What? Well, it really is dependent upon some of the effort that the patients really want to put into it. It's a lot of lifestyle changes to work towards this recovery and improving their quality of life. So when we say recovery, tell me about some of the steps that are in recovery. So yeah, the goal is to get back to regular life, regular living, which for teenagers means going to school, having friends, doing things with friends, getting involved in extracurricular activities. To get there from being terribly fatigued, from being dizzy when they stand up and having pain, takes a lot of practical steps. And some of them are the opposite of what the individual's body wants to do. So they need to get up, they need to be active, they need to get into an aerobic exercise program. They need to adjust what they eat and drink with more fluid and more salt. Uh -huh. And then they need to get help to keep their mind in charge of their body so their mind can be running what the body does rather than the mind just serving what the body feels like. You know what is interesting in reading some of the background and doing some of the research that I have just to get ready for these interviews, I found it very interesting. When they talk about the things that can trigger problems, it's stress-related items. But I'm thinking, wait, isn't exercise kind of, couldn't? that trigger it do just the opposite so a lot of times people get sick with the confluence of several things happening at once whether it's an illness or an injury but recovery means you have to take charge and get better uh, stress it can happen if you exercise too much if you don't exercise at all you're not going to get better but if you have a graded step-by-step -step increasing exercise program then you actually can recover what does the exercise part of it do to the body what's happening there so we know that exercise helps to improve blood flow in patients with POTS, and that's a key factor in improving how they feel on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. We know that exercise will help to decrease fatigue, it improves strength, it improves stamina and endurance, and really helps patients to move towards that recovery. We also know that it puts off endorphins in the body, natural feel-good painkillers, and many patients with POTS struggle with a lot of chronic pain, so we know that it's going to help decrease their pain also. Now, how long did it take before you came up with this regime of knowing how to, to rehab somebody? I'm, I'm curious. Um, everybody has a personal story. For me, it was figuring out what POTS is, what's involved, how to treat it medically, how to treat with lifestyle changes. But it was about 12 years ago we came up with the realization that just telling people the individual pieces of what to do wasn't enough for those that were most severely debilitated. And that's when we realized we needed to put the pieces together into a comprehensive rehabilitation program. Now you know what happens with, when people, particularly teenagers, go through this. They are told sometimes, hey, this is all in your head. You're all making this stuff up if you just get up and get running, blah, blah, blah. So how do you get convinced a teenager or anybody who's going through rehab that this is not in your head and yet you have to do a little mind readjusting to say, I've got to take charge of something that people tell me I'm not crazy, but it feels like I am. And I'll tell them that the problem is not in their head, but part of the solution is. The problem is the involuntary nervous system that runs throughout the whole body. Mm -hmm. This is a body problem, but part of the solution is getting their head back in control of, their head, of the rest of the body. So how do they receive that when you tell them that? 
They're typically grateful to hear that we don't feel like the problem is all in their head. But many of the patients that we see are very high achievers, they're good athletes, they're great students, and so we kind of try to play off of the strength of let's use your really good, strong, smart mind to help overcome what's going on with your body. Yeah, so it's more than just a pep talk, but th but these again, you get this. These are again high achievers. These are motivated people to begin with. So if if a person isn't motivated, is there any chance for rehab? Step by step, yes. They don't need to take the third step down the road, but they need to take the current step. And once they start taking some steps toward recovery and seeing that it works, once they see other people going through the same process and recovering, then they get motivated for one more step and one more. So progressively they grow toward motivation and they grow toward recovery. Okay, one of the things that, that chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, that, boy, I remember in the news business when, when 10 or 15 years ago, when people started using that, people got so frustrated because then anytime they got tired, they go, I have chronic fatigue syndrome. Clinically, what's the difference between being tired or having chronic fatigue syndrome? So chronic fatigue means tired for a long time. Chronic fatigue syndrome to a physician is a specific research diagnosis to compare similar patients by how they do. For teenagers, I don't use the term chronic fatigue syndrome. They have fatigue and it's lasted for a long time, so it's chronic fatigue. But I find that many, if we call it chronic fatigue syndrome, then go to the internet and somehow are led to believe that they're never gonna get better. So I have them focus on, yes, you've been tired, yes, it's been for a long time, but you have something from which you can recover. So sometimes the term chronic fatigue syndrome, even though it's a legitimate medical research term, mm -hmm. sometimes that term ends up distracting them from the potential they have for recovery. So t to walk me through, let's say I'm a patient, I'm coming into your clinic right now, what's gonna happen to me, and kinda give me some time frames on this. One week, three weeks, four weeks, what? For a patient coming into an intensive rehabilitation center program, it's a lot of times a three-week program. Um, the program that we have at Mayo Clinic would be 17 business days. And in that program, there will be a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy, there's exercise, there's occupational therapy, recreation therapy. There's amazing peer support from other teens who understand what it's like to be going through this difficult time. There's parent component in many of these programs. We know that parents need to be re-educated on how to help their teens with their recovery. Mm -hmm. In families of patients with with POTS, the focus tends to be on the teen who's struggling with all the chronic symptoms and everyday parents are asking, oh, how do you feel today? Do you have a headache? Rate oh, your yeah. pain for me today. And we want to get away from the focus on pain behaviors and move towards that recovery and normalization of life again. Getting back to talking about normal activities and sports and school and all those sorts of things. We also know that mindfulness is an essential component of a recovery program. Deep diaphragmatic breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, guided imagery, yoga, tai chi, these are all activities that are going to help to decrease the sympathetic nervous system dominance that occurs in these kinds of patients, turn on that parasympathetic nervous system and help promote rest and digest and recovery. We know that the research tells us that in this patient population, if we're doing activities such as that for 25 to 30 minutes a day, it is going to help decrease their symptoms. Right. Now, it, it this isn't just covering up the symptoms and the symptoms are still there, it is correcting it? The symptoms eventually will go away. For the pain, they might still have the pain, but they're not going to focus on it, they're not going to think about it, and they'll function in spite of it. And then gradually over time, the pain will actually go away. So it's one thing to try to develop some kind of protocol, but what is the evidence, the scientific evidence, that this stuff really works? Somebody once said that the proof is in the pudding. I think the same thing holds here, and we have scientific evidence that the outcomes show that patients get better with this. We also know it's plausible and scientific for each step we've involved. There are good data showing that cognitive behavioral therapy helps a lot for chronic pain, for chronic fatigue, and for POTS. There are good data that shows that an exercise program is effective. And when we put it all together into a full-on rehabilitation program, 85 plus percent of our patients are back to nearly normal activity by with the few days right after the end of the program. We wrote up our first thousand patients that went through our rehab program. We have data showing that patients get better and those improvements are sustained for months and months afterwards. The proof is in the pudding. The testimonials add up to standardized studies and research data that say yes, it works.
No, one thing that we're trying to do with this project is to make sure that other doctors, other physicians know about this kind of stuff. We know this clinic exists at, at Mayo in Rochester, near my hometown, by the way. <laughs> I had to throw that in. Uh, but what about other clinics? Do they know and understand the same kind of information as you do? There are several places in the country that are doing this. What seems to be important is to have a multidisciplinary team bringing together physicians and psychologists and occupational therapists and physical therapists and nurses with educators all together bringing together a full team to help the patient and the family get better. Some places do this as an inpatient program, a few others do this as an outpatient program, and most have found that it takes about three weeks of consistent activity to be able to ingrain the new habits into the yeah. life so that somebody can get better. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Keep up the good work, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you.